Again, I'm Pastor Mike Decker. Say hello, Pastor Mike. Hello. Today we're going to unpack a Bible story uh, that describes an interaction that Jesus had one day with some children. And in this story, which is only three verses long here in Luke 18, let me find it with you. Here in this, this verse, this, this story, even though it's only three verses long, I propose that there are four truths or sort of four lessons that you and I can personalize and apply in our own life as it relates to our individual, individual relationship with, with Jesus. And so I'm going to start reading at verse 15 in Luke chapter 18. I uh, encourage you to follow along in your Bible if you feel more comfortable uh, looking at the screen behind me or for those of you tuning in online, the verses will be in front of you. This is what we read. And as always, try to picture the scene in your mind. One day, some parents brought their little children to Jesus so he could touch and bless them. But when the disciples saw this, they scolded the parents for bothering him. Then Jesus called for the children and said to his disciples, let the children come to me. Don't stop them. For the kingdom of God belongs to those who are like this, these children. I tell you the truth, verse 17. Anyone who doesn't receive the kingdom of God like a child will never enter it. Now would you write this down, truth number one in your app notes. Jesus always has time for me. He is never too busy. Jesus always has time for me. He is never too busy. You know, with a show of hands, how many of you have ever heard the statement, children should be seen but not heard? Have you heard that statement? You know, growing up as a child, that phrase, children should be seen and not heard, was something that I was told uh, quite often, particularly because my younger brother and I illustrated, apparently from other people's perspective, a natural uh, proclivity to be loud and disruptive, which I suspect most of you find a, that hard to believe, right? Uh, uh, but, you know, Let's, let's take a little poll here with a show of hands. Uh, how many of you uh, have sort of a loud personality? Can I see that? Okay, Joe, I'm glad you're raising your hand. Millie, yeah, th thank, thank you. Uh, uh, Bev, too. Yep. Uh, let's bring out a little bit more loudness, Bev. Bring it out. Come on, let's, let's go. I love it. <clears throat> you know, uh, parents in Jesus' day were here on the totem pole of importance, but children were downhill. You know, when we read the Bible, uh, we know that children were sort of at the bottom of the, what we might call the food chain. One of the Ten Commandments instructs children to obey their parents. And so in the Jewish context, and really still to this day, many times parents will raise their children to teach them to be quiet and, and oftentimes well-mannered. And so here we read in our Bible story in Luke chapter 18 how some parents, they make this effort to bring their children to Jesus, to leave him, to have him possibly pray over them. And what is the disciples, Jesus' disciples' response? They shush them away, right? You see, from their perspective, Jesus was too busy to want to spend any of his time with the little children. He didn't have time to be distracted by children. At least that's the, what their assumption was, was it not? Now, were they right or were they wrong? They were wrong. And in Jesus' response, by instructing his, these, his, them to let these little children come to him, I think Jesus is reinforcing for us the legacy kingdom, the kingdom legacy truth that Jesus welcomes every age, both old and young. You know, I don't know if any of you have ever experienced uh, in a time or something in your life uh, but typically my observation is that the, the more important a person becomes, sort of the higher you go on the, the status level or the food chain, my observation is that your inclination is to separate yourself from the little people, right, who want a piece of you. The more fame you get, the more popularity you get, maybe even the more uh, responsibility you get, you have a tendency, my observation is to kind of circle the wagons and, and kind of keep people away and only maybe invite those people into their, your life who, who have something to offer, something who can make your life better. 
But fortunately for us, brothers and sisters, Jesus is not that kind of guy. Rather, the Bible showcases, certainly here in our story, how Jesus always has time for people, especially for the little people uh, at the bottom of the food chain. You know, have any of you experienced yet or met someone in your life who we might describe as a dream killer? You ever had anybody say to you, well, that can't be done? Or maybe they say to you, you know, if I were you, uh, I wouldn't do that. Well, guess what? You're not me. And there are people in this world, I think like the disciples originally here in the, in the first part of the story, who will try to shush you away. Who will bring negativity into your world and, and, and kind of say, ah, you know, try to encourage you to, to, to pull back, if you will, or to pull back from, from pursuing your dreams. Don't listen to them. Say no to those naysayers. Brothers and sisters, I propose that Jesus here in this story always has time for us. He's never too busy for us. And so when we have a dream and we want to go to the Lord with our dream or ambition, I think Jesus will say, let's hear, let's hear about it. Let me hear your dreams. Let me hear your, what you want to do. You know, as you can likely assume as a pastor, I've done enough counseling in my life and associated with enough people to learn that there are people in this world who have a low self-esteem. Our world is filled with people who have been beat up both figuratively and literally because of the, the shunners, right? And I would attest that in a group our size, uh, some of you likely or probably or had a possibility of being raised by parents or maybe you've been in a relationship where someone was verbally abusive and negative, Perhaps some of you sitting here today or maybe tuning in online, maybe you can share a heart-wrenching story when maybe somebody verbally abused you with demeaning, harsh words that maybe still poke at your self-esteem, if you're really honest. You can still hear those, those words kind of echoing and bouncing forth, back and forth in your mind. You know, for those of you who can identify with that heart breaking scenario and consequently you might be tempted to believe that Jesus doesn't have time for you. I want you to hear me very clearly based upon what Jesus says here in verse 16 that he does. He says, let the little children come to me. Let those people who are at the bottom of the food chain, let those people who've been beat up in this life, let those people who have experienced tragedy and hardship and, and maybe things haven't always gone your way, let them come to me. Translation, Jesus always has time for you. Jesus is never too busy. Jesus, hear me on this, believes in me. So on the count of three, out loud, I want you to say the phrase, Jesus believes in me. You ready? One, two, three. Jesus believes in me. Jesus believes in you, brothers and sisters. Jesus believes in me. He always has time for us. So let's take a deep breath. Everybody take a deep breath. We're going to say a simple prayer of thanks, okay? Inhale, can hold it. Exhale. Now in your heart and in your mind, pray this. Say, Jesus, thank you that you always have time for me. Say, Jesus, thank you that you're never too busy. In the same way that you had time for these little children, Jesus, help me to sit in this truth that you have time for me. Good. Truth number two. The second truth that I propose this Bible story teaches us is the truth that Jesus generously receives me because of who he is, not because of anything or any merit that I bring. Jesus generously receives me for who he is, not because of any merit I bring. Amen. You know, some of you know, years ago, I had a cousin, a first cousin of mine, a younger cousin, who played professional hockey for the San Jose Sharks and the Calgary Flames. And so for 10 years, uh, Robin and I would go to the hockey games, many times here in Anaheim or in Los Angeles with the Kings played, and, and we, would, we would watch uh, Mark play, and Mark would always provide us with great seats, and we'd go to the stadium, and then after the game, the, 
probably the best perk of, of the night is we would get on the sort of the arena uh, elevator and we would go to the very basement, the very, you know, kind of the dungeon, if you will, of the arena down to where the locker room was to this family gathering area where we would be able to have a conversation with Mark and his teammates as they kind of came out of the game and after their, you know, their press conference and whatnot before getting on the bus to get on an airplane or to go to the next arena or to, to uh, you know, to their, whether it be local or abroad. It was a great, super fun experience. And sometimes I would bring buddies. I can remember one, one encounter where I had two or I had three buddies along and they all had hockey pucks. They had brought hockey pucks and, and these kind of these sharpie, these gray sharpies and Timu Solani signed and he had just got back from the Olympics and had won a gold medal for the, for the uh, Canadian Olympic team. And it was just a really fun night where people could get autographs if, if that's what they, they wanted. You know, the only reason that Robin and I had access to this VIP area, to this player, to the players and to the part of the arena uh, that very few people were allowed into was because of my cousin's credentials, not because of our own. And we, that's totally what we see here illustrated in this Bible story. These children in our Bible story were not granted any access to Jesus because of anything they had done or maybe even because of anything their parents had done, but rather these children were invited to spend time with Jesus because Jesus wanted to connect with them. You do know, don't you, that Jesus still wants to connect with you and me today? You know, on the count of three, let me hear you say out loud the phrase, I like that. One, two, three. I like that. I like that too. Jesus generously receives me because of who he is, not because of any merit that I bring. Listen, I don't know what mistakes you have made in your life. I don't know what kind of baggage some of you might be carrying with you today, but what I do know, based upon what this Bible story teaches us and what I choose to believe and encourage you to believe too, based upon what the Bible story illustrates here, is that generously, Jesus generously receives you and me, not because of any merit that we bring. Can I get an amen? amen. You know, we're all going to stand before God someday and he's going to say, why should I let you into heaven? We, we talk about that, right? And, and it's not going to be because of the good deeds that we did. It's not going to be because you are, you know, meticulously taking notes in your app of the sermon today. It's not going to be because of maybe the positivity to you bring, as great as that is. It's not going to be because you live a life of gener generosity, because we know the Bible says that those who are generous will be refreshed themselves. It's not going to be going to be because of anything that we bring. Rather, it's going to be because of what? Because of Jesus. You know, every time we look at a cross, whether it's on a wall like this or maybe around someone's neck, we should be reminded of the, the, book, the verse in Ephesians chapter 2, which we talked about last week. It says that by grace you're going to get saved, not because of works. Jesus generously receives you and me because of who he is, not because of any merit I bring. Can I get an amen? Amen. amen. So truth number three, write this down. A third truth that I believe the Bible, and I propose really this Bible story teaches us, is the truth that Jesus calls me to live interdependently, not independently. Jesus calls me and he calls you to live interdependently, not independently. Palm Harbor Church, how did these children gain access to Jesus? Did they approach Jesus on their own, yes or no? No. Did they see Jesus off in the distance when, when their parents turned their head? They made a quick dash and bolted toward Jesus? Is that what we read, yes or no? No. No, we're told what here? We're told that the parents brought them to Jesus, didn't they? And after initially being pushed away, Jesus' Jesus's disciples ushered these children into Jesus' presence. So don't miss this. It's a very subtle, yet I'm suggesting a very important life lesson here. Jesus and his posse of 12 disciples were a team. These children, along with their parents, 
were a team modeling for us team living not independent isolationist living which is why I'm suggesting that Jesus in this simple story the Bible writer in this simple story is suggesting to us that he invites us to live interdependent lives not independent always easy to do yes or no no. And it's particularly hard for those of us who maybe aren't really that social. You know, some of you, when, you, when, you're, when you're maybe tired or you need a little pick-me-up, you'll go have, you'll go spend time with people, right? You'll go have a cup of coffee or you'll go, hey, let's go see a movie together or let's, you know, go for a walk or you want to be with people. Others of you, and I'm this way, believe it or not, as I love people, but people drain me. And if I really want to have my batteries recharged, I got to get on the motorcycle. And aside from having Robin with me, I, just really, I don't really want to be around a lot of people. And yet, that being said, Jesus calls me and those of us who are a little less social than others to be interdependent, not independent. You know, years ago when I was working on my doctorate degree, I had a professor who uh, I later learned, I didn't know this at the time, I, I was in class and I was sitting there and there were all these people that had flown in from all over the country to be in this, this one week class with a man by the name of Mike Wilkins, Dr. Mike Wilkins. And I was just there because it was one of the classes required, part of my, my, my three year program that, that I was in, just because that was, you know, part of the, you know, the, I, what do you call it, the class list, there's a right term, but what is it called, Kirk? Course sequence. Uh, say it again. Course yeah, the course sequence, right? <laughs> Whatever he just said. I can't, by the way, I'm, I have Invisalign now. You know what that is? It's like braces, and so if you hear me, if you hear me like the, 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 just that's be, that's the reason. So that's why I have such a good smile. But anyways, back to Mike Wilkins. So Mike Wilkins is, is one of these leading theologians, Bible scholars. They learned, later learned he's this amazing Bible scholar that people fly in from all over the world to, to spend time with. And his, his, his book of expertise is the Gospel of Matthew. Now what's so interesting and relatable about Mike Wilkins is that he was a Marine. He was in the Marine Corps. He was a, a served in Vietnam. He was hardcore, bad, fill-in-the-blank dude. And after coming out of the war, after dealing with all the violence and the leading that he did in the war, someone introduced him to Jesus. And Mike went to Jesus. He gave his heart to Jesus. He asked Jesus to forgive his sins, be the Lord of his life. And so as every Christian, new Christian does, as many of you, as we're doing here today, he started to read the Bible. And as he began to read the Bible and study the Bible, he realized that he had this sort of this natural ability to not just read the Bible and to understand the Bible, but to more than that, to really read and understand the original languages, Hebrew and Greek. And so as he began to kind of apply himself to this, this study using his worldview as a Marine Corps veteran, you know, God in the process began to shape Mike into this amazing, amazing Bible teacher. In fact, probably one of the best Bible teachers I've ever sat under. The, for the whole week I was in the front row, I go here and Mike was there, and I thought, I have never heard anybody teach like this. this I feel like I'm sitting at the feet of Jesus. It was amazing. Now I share all that to say that Mike has written many books and many commentaries and there's a commentary that he wrote, uh, that a piece that I want to specifically quote for you uh, so you sort of have the context of who it's coming from and this is what Mike has to say and I quote. Bless you. He said we, he said, we must never get too preoccupied with our own advancement in Christian service and maturity. Let me say that again. We must never get too preoccupied with our own advancement in Christian service and maturity that we forget that we are here to help other disciples on the path, including those who backslide. Although we should participate in the joy of Christian fellowship, like we're doing here, he writes, we must give ourselves to the prayer pursuit and restoration of those who have gone astray. Translation, we should live interdependently, not independently. We should care about our neighbor, not just 
ourselves. You know, in the same way that Jesus taught how the shepherd, remember the story where Jesus taught where the shepherd left the, the 99 sheep in the flock to pursue the one? Remember that story? That's the story of the lost coin and the lost sheep and then the parable of the lost son. In the same way that Jesus tells how the good shepherd will leave the 99 to go after the, pursue the one that's lost. Brothers and sisters, I'm suggesting that had these parents not been intentional about bringing their children to Jesus, that likely these children never would have met Jesus on their own. And I propose that that is still true for the people in your and my world. Would you agree with that? Who do you know? who you could intentionally reach out to and maybe invite some weekend to join you here at Palm Harvest for a service. Who do you know who you could invite to a Bible study that you're a part of? You know, most of you have heard me say uh, ad nauseum about the principle, the 5.3 principle. Y'all remember what that is? The 5.3 principle. The average statistics have shown that the average person before they give their heart to Jesus before they trust in Jesus as their Savior and then invite Him to be the Lord of their life, they will have an authentic relationship with 5.3 other Christians. And so that's why when you go play golf or when you go skiing or when you do what you love to do, you don't just go with, by yourself. You bring, a non, you bring a Christian buddy and maybe you bring a non-Christian buddy. You bring a Christian sister and you bring a non-Christian sister. Because the goal is, they already know you, they already have a relationship with you, but the goal is to let them see somebody else who also claims to be a believer. And after, over time, the, the statistics have shown that after 5.3 interactions, people go, you know what, there's something about you. You guys have something that I don't have. I want that. And Jim, that's kind of what your story, right? You talk about Norma and the influence that she had in your life, right? And like her, she was so happy. She was so full of life. And, you know, we all have people in that. Where we've been impacted by people who have influenced us, that have helped shape us and moved us towards a decision for Jesus. Someone introduced these children to Jesus. And I'm proposing that the same is true for you and for me. And maybe that's your own story. Friends, when was the last time, again, that you invited someone to join you here for a week in service? Or invited them to join you at your Bible study? We've got two Bible studies. There's a, Robin's doing a study. Kirk's doing a study. There's a women's retreat that's coming up. I think this is the last weekend for us to sign up. Maybe that's something that you want to be a part of. Or maybe for those of you who are even on social media. No, not everybody is, but for those of you who are, you know, Beto spends a lot of time, I don't know how much time, but he spends some time, and I do too, where we'll take these clips, these little sermon clips, these 30-second clips, and we'll post them up as reels. And some people, we have people who actually interact with us on these reels. Some people are positive, some people are less positive. But all yeah, I would just say, for those of you who, when you see a Palm Harvest Reel that maybe Beto puts up, or whether it's on our YouTube channel or on my Hello Pastor Mike channel, on YouTube, maybe you just share it with a friend, send it to a friend, say, hey, this really touched my life, what do you think? Let's talk about it. Invite people to step into your spiritual journey. God, I think, tells us here, and this illustrates this here, how we are to live interdependently, not independently, right? Okay, so let's pray another prayer. So again, palms open, heart open, mind open, deep breath in, hold it, exhale. Now just pray this. Say, Jesus, please forgive me when I practice independent, isolationist living. Now I want you to think of her friend. I want you to think of someone in your life who might be open to the possibility of having a Jesus conversation. Just picture them in your mind. Now pray this. Say, Jesus, please touch and put their name in today. Please touch and you fill in the blank. And say, Jesus, please open the door for me to introduce you to them. This is my legacy prayer today. In Jesus' name, in your name, everybody said? Amen. Amen. Good. Okay. Truth number four. Let's land the plane. The fourth truth that I propose this Bible story teaches us is the truth that Jesus invites me to engage him with childlike trust. 
Jesus invites me and he invites you to engage him with childlike trust. Look again at what Jesus writes in verses 16 and 17. Then Jesus, we read, called for the children and said to the disciples, let the, will, let the children come to me. Don't stop them. For the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. I assure you, anyone who doesn't have their kind of faith will never get into the kingdom of God. The question, is it easy or is it hard for you to trust people? You know, do you have a natural inclination to take people at their word? Or do you have a tendency to be a little skeptical? How many skeptics do we have? Maybe discernment, we would say, in the house, okay? How many of you just blindly trust people? Right? I tend to be more in the blindly trust people category. I suspect that some of you have a hard time trusting people. Is that a fair assumption? Because maybe you've been burned in your life. Or maybe some of you have been betrayed by even a close loved one. You know, for others of you, like you showed already with your hands, it's trusting people is maybe easy for you. I suggest, and I, my experience is that children trustingly follow. Would you agree with that? We read here how some parents, they bring their little children to Jesus with the hope that he will touch and, and bless them. You know, there's no mention of these children throwing a temper tantrum. In our Bible story, there's no mention of these children hollering and screaming in protest, creating this embarrassing scene for their parents. No, the Bible writer describes simply how these children follow their parents lead. Why? Children, it's because children trust. Children follow. Children approach most things with a positive attitude. You could fill a water bottle with gasoline and hand it to a child and say, here, drink this. And they would drink it. But you give it to one of you, one of you guys, you'd be like, I'm not drinking that. That looks kind of murky. Would you agree with me when I suggest that a loving parent does what is in the best interest of their child? Would you agree with that statement? Friends, Jesus encourages you and me to pursue our relationship with him with childlike trust, to follow and apply the, the teachings of the Bible obediently. Why? Because Jesus has our best interests in mind. So ponder this. What holds you back from trusting Jesus? From trusting God? What holds you back, for example, to turn the other cheek and forgive your enemies? Is that hard for you to do? Jesus tells us to do it. He suggests that it's in our best interest to do it. And yet some of us have a hard time doing that. Some of us have a hard time letting go of the wrongs that people may have done to us. Jesus taught us that as his followers were to lay our burdens on him, right? Is that hard for you to do? Is it hard for you to lay your burdens at Jesus' feet and then leave them there, just trusting that he's got things under control? Or do you lay them down and then walk away and then pretty soon you go back and pick it up and go, ah, oh, this feels good, you know, right? Not that good, but it feels good. Jesus taught his followers to emulate little children. And I suggest little children trust. So where the question for you and the question for me is where is Jesus inviting you to trust him? With what is Jesus inviting you to trust him? 
Jesus invites me to engage him with childlike trust. Especially true when it comes to heaven. You know, friends, no more will your good deeds get you into heaven than your sin will keep you out of heaven. Both of them are not going to get you into heaven. The only way you and I are going to get to heaven is by how? It's by trusting Jesus. When Jesus says, uh, you know, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one gets to the Father except through me. Well, I want to be with you. I want that VIP access. So don't beat yourself up. You know, it's easy for us to beat ourselves up about what we've done or haven't done in our life. And then the devil loves it when we live in this murky, murky place. And Jesus says, let, let, let that go. Keep moving forward. I'm inviting you. Come, let's, be, let's have community together as we're doing here today. I want you to write this down somewhere in the, maybe at the bottom of your, of your notes or if you're taking pen and paper in hand. Betty's going to put a, a phrase up here on the screen to help you. And I love it. I, I want you to spend the rest of this week maybe just kind of pondering this. And it's this phrase. We trust completely because the one we trust is completely trustworthy. We trust completely because the one we trust is completely trustworthy. Brothers, in this, and sisters, in this simple Bible story, we can read how Jesus always has time for us. He's never too busy. Jesus generously receives us because of who he is, not because of any merit I bring. Jesus calls me and he calls you to live interdependently, not independently. Jesus invites us to engage him with childlike trust. Why? We trust completely because the one we trust is completely trustworthy. So let's say one final trust prayer, okay? Put your palms open, put everything down. Deep breath in, David's going to come up and he's going to finish out the service. But before he does, as he's up here, put your place in a heart of receptivity, hands open. Deep breath in, say, God, I want more of you. That's why I'm here today. Exhale less of me. I'll say, Jesus, please help me to trust you with, and you fill in the blank. What are you concerned currently about? I also want you to think right now of something that you'd like to accomplish this year. Something positive. Something good. Something maybe life changing. What would you like to see happen in 2024? What would you like to do that you've never done before? Or go where you've never been before? Think of one positive thing that you would love God to help you accomplish this year. I pray this, say, Jesus, please help me to trust you with, and then you fill that in the blank. I want to be more positive. I want to be more generous. I want to be less critical. What do you want to accomplish this year? I want to be healthier. I want to be more life-giving. I want to be a better dad to my kids or mom to my kids, a friend to my workmates. What do you want God to do in your life? Jesus, say, I trust you this year to help me do this and fill in the blank. This is my legacy prayer today. I pray in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. All right. Would you stand, please? It's really, it's really weird. Hold on. You can, it's really weird, but uh, the last few weeks as I stand here up front with all of you, something's different. You know, I live, uh, most of my life, I have my discerning antennas up and, and, and I just, uh, we talk about it in staff meeting, like God's spirit is, is moving. 
uh, something has shifted recently, and I, 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 I don't really know what it is, but I'm expecting that God's doing something in our lives and in our church family, in your life and mine. And I'm like, guys, get prepared, because I think the spirits are about ready to bust loose here, and I don't know what that's going to look like. But I'm expectant. And I'm trusting that we're going to, together, we'll figure it out. So if you're in a bad place today or you're in a good place today, being in a good place is better than being in a bad place. But I just want you to know that we're in this together. And God wants to meet with you. He wants to bless you. And he wants you to use, he wants to use you and me to impact the lives of people around us. And being kind is not complicated. Saying thank you is not complicated. Just love on people this week. So put your hands open. So brothers and sisters, as you leave here today, recognize that you are God's hands and feet. And he's going to use you and he's going to transform you. And, and as you, as people watch you work through your issues, both good and bad, know that people are watching and, and he's going to use your story to touch people's lives. He's using your story to touch my life. And for that, I'm deeply grateful. So as you leave here today, leave with the authority of God's Holy Spirit. For those of you who have never given your heart to Jesus, I encourage you to do so. Just say, Jesus, as much as I know, I invite you to be a part of my life. Fill me up. Be his hands and feet this week, Palm Harvest. I bless you in the name of God the Father, Jesus the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen and amen and amen. I'm just